In the mountains and rainforests of Central America, two continents meet. Some three million years ago, North and South America were joined by a land bridge that allowed a great variety of animals and plants to intermingle and separated the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. In Belize, on the Atlantic side of this bridge, the rainforest teems with an abundance and variety of life unsurpassed anywhere in the world. In the hot, humid valleys, trees in profusion crowd the river's edge, but one tree stands out above all the others, not only in its great size, but in giving life and shelter to a host of animals that depend on it for their existence. The fig tree, the great tree that the Indians call Amate. A male black howler monkey greets the new day with a roar that can be heard for two miles. His tree is a wild fig, a giant whose massive trunk has a girth of over 30 feet at its base and branches reaching 100 feet into the air. It bears figs that ripen at any time of the year and these are an important part of the diet of many animals. Soon after dawn, howler monkeys leave their overnight roosting place in a thicket and climb into the fig tree. Howlers live in troops of up to 40 individuals of all ages. The black howler is the largest monkey in Central America, and this big male will weigh about 20 pounds. They are highly selective in their diet, eating all of the young shoots, but only parts of the mature leaves. In this way, they avoid being poisoned by the accumulation of toxins present in the older leaves. They are entirely vegetarian, feeding on flowers and fruit as well as leaves and are particularly attracted to figs. Fig trees are most abundant along the river banks, where they are in full sunlight and where their roots can reach down into the river itself. In the branches above, male iguanas display to one another. Like the howlers, they too feed on the leaves. Iguanas are superb climbers spending a great deal of their lives in the trees, sunning themselves on the exposed branches when they're not feeding. Despite their fearsome appearance, iguanas are harmless and entirely vegetarian, survivors from an age when the reptiles ruled the world. They have very keen eyesight and are alert to the slightest hint of danger. Iguanas have no means of defense, and when their arch enemy, the black hawk, appears overhead, they have a simple but effective means of escape. Underwater, they are safe, and as much at home as in the trees.
reptile even more at home in the river is the hickatee, a freshwater turtle and a vegetarian like the iguana. It too eats fig leaves, but being confined to the river, it has to wait for leaves or a branch to fall into the water. Like all reptiles, the hickety must breathe air, and its nostrils are located at the very tip of its snout, so that it can take in air without revealing its whereabouts. Fig leaves not eaten by the hickety are devoured by water snails. Snails will also feed on figs which have fallen from an overhanging branch. All that is left of the leaves when they have finished are their skeletons decomposing on the river bed. The story of how the great fig tree begins its life is one of the most intriguing in the whole of nature. From the outside, the fig looks much the same throughout the season. But inside, hundreds of flowers bloom and are pollinated and seeds grow and ripen, all hidden from view. The fig's flowers open into a cavity connected to the outside by a tunnel so narrow that only a minute black wasp is able to pass through to pollinate the flowers. Tree and wasp are dependent on one another. When the fig is in flower, the female wasps find the entrance to the interior and force their way in. Their single objective is to lay their eggs in the newly opened flowers. One after another, the tiny insects, each so small that it could stand on the head of a pin, squeeze through the narrow passage with the greatest difficulty, some even losing their wings and antennae in the process. Moving about inside the fig, the wasps scatter pollen grains which they have carried on their bodies, and in this way the flowers are fertilized. Probing with their ovipositors, they lay their eggs inside the female flowers. The eggs will hatch and the larvae will be nourished by the fig. Having laid their eggs, the fig wasps die. Eventually a new generation will emerge, except for those larvae that fall victim to another species of wasp which parasitizes them. This parasitic wasp lays her eggs where they will hatch and live off the larvae of the fig wasp. And to do this, she must be able to probe deep into the fig. How she knows exactly where they are is a mystery. When egg-laying, her enormously long ovipositor, normally protected by a tail-like sheath, is formed into a loop and guided down a groove between her legs. All over the surface of the fig, these parasitic wasps scurry about, choosing a precise spot above where the fig wasps' larvae are lying. Looking like a tiny drilling rig, she braces her legs and forces the ovipositor, finer than a hair, down through the body of the fig. Once in position, she passes eggs down the ovipositor, placing them where they will hatch and feed on the fig wasp's larvae.
As the season draws on, fig wasp and parasite mature in their capsules, and the unparasitized seeds of the fig swell and grow. A centuries-old fig tree supports a miniature jungle on its limbs. From the topmost branches in full sunlight, down through the tree to leafy shade, plants of many kinds cling to the bare bark or grow in the humus created by the decay of others, and all owing their existence to their host, the giant fig tree. This vine snake is on the lookout for prey among the tangle of plants in the fig tree. But the tree frog is quite safe. If the snake were to strike, the frog would release an irritant slime from glands on its back that would cause the snake to let go immediately. So it leaves the frog to look elsewhere for a meal. Of all the plants that grow on the tree, only one poses a threat to its host. The strangler fig begins life as a seedling drawing sustenance from rain running down the trunk. But soon it puts out aerial roots that grow year by year until they reach the ground. In the course of time, the strangler lives up to its name, wrapping itself tightly round the trunk of its host as though strangling it to death. When the great fig tree eventually does die, the strangler lives on as an independent tree. This collared arasari, one of the toucan family, has been collecting insects and seeds to feed to its young in their nest in a branch of the tree. At this age, the young are well developed and clamor loudly for food. parent usually returns with an insect, in this case a large grasshopper, in its bill and a store of seeds and fruit in its throat pouch. The young have insatiable appetites and the parents have to work hard to find enough food. The huge bill may look cumbersome, but the arasari uses it with amazing dexterity. A much smaller hole in the fig tree has become the home of a colony of Mayan stingless bees. A guard at the entrance checks every bee entering the hive. They've laid down wax to restrict the hole and provide guidelines for the foraging bees returning with nectar and pollen. From a branch of the fig tree hangs the huge paper nest of a colony of vicious black wasps. Insects of all kinds attract birds to the tree. The barred ant shrike is a regular visitor in the mornings when the insects are most active. This fly grooming itself on a leaf seems to have a pattern on its wings resembling a crouching spider. But if this pattern is for protection, it is ineffective against the ant shrike. This weevil is attracted by the white latex which exudes from a wound in the fruit or a twig or leaf. 
Within seconds, a party of guzzling flies descends to lap up the sticky sap until the wound heals. The figs are now nearly ripe. Inside their capsules, the fig wasps darken as they mature, and the fig seeds, too, are almost ripe. The male wasps are about to emerge, while the females are still contained in their capsules. The male fig wasp doesn't look like a wasp at all. He has no wings or eyes, but he has powerful jaws and strong front legs. Once he has chewed his way out of his capsule, he will make his way to one containing a female, cut a hole in it, and fertilize her through the hole as she lies curled up inside. His duty done, he will die. Shortly afterwards, the female bites her way out, along with hundreds of others, all maturing at the same time. But in some of the capsules that originally held fig wasps, there will now be parasitic wasps, and these are also ready to emerge. She too bites her way out, unwinding her ovipositor, which has been coiled around her like a watch spring. At this time, the interior of the fig is a mass of wasps and parasites. It is only now that the fig produces pollen. As the fig wasps come into contact with the anthers, they pick up pollen grains, and these will be carried to the next fig that the wasps enter to lay their eggs. The entrance to the fig which has until now been tightly closed, opens as the fruit ripens, allowing the wasps to emerge. After a thorough grooming, they all fly off to find other figs in which to lay their eggs, and so the cycle begins again. The figs now ripen quickly, and those overhanging the river fall into the water. They're instantly attacked by myriads of small caracin fish related to piranhas. 
The figs are soon reduced to shreds, but the seeds will be distributed downstream by the current. The much larger cichlids also eat figs. Falling figs attract many of the forest animals, but few dare to come for them in broad daylight. Collared peccaries stay together in family groups and have little to fear in the forest except man. In fact, they are justifiably feared themselves. They can be very dangerous and will attack if they feel threatened. The peccary has a fearful bite, with tusks in both upper and lower jaws. Although a peccary may look like a wild pig, it is only distantly related to the pig family. A gland opening on their backs releases a scent by which members of the group recognize each other. So many figs fall that not all are eaten and many rot into the ground. Of the many thousands of seeds produced in a season, only one or two may germinate and grow, first into a seedling, and then a young fig. Perhaps one in a million will grow to be a giant like its parent. As the sun sets, the twilight animals begin to stir. From its underground burrow, a tamandua, or tree-climbing anteater, emerges to hunt for ants and termites in the fig tree. From a branch above, a tree porcupine watches its approach. It has long claws and feet adapted for climbing trees and uses its prehensile tail as a fifth limb. It is covered with short quills except for its great bulbous nose. The tree porcupine's expression always seems to be one of total bewilderment. The tamandua is as much at home in trees as on the ground, and like the tree porcupine, it too uses its tail as an extra limb. It is immensely strong and makes up for the fact that it has no jaws or teeth by using the huge claws on its front feet as powerful tools 
or as terrible weapons in defence. With its long, sensitive nose, it hunts for ants and termites' nests, ripping them open with its claws. It gathers up termites on its sticky tongue. In the wild, an accidental encounter between two animals rarely results in aggression, unless there is competition for food, or territory, or a mate. When the tamandua and the porcupine meet, they treat each other with what in humans we would call respect. For them, avoidance causes less stress than confrontation, and so they quietly go their own ways. At the beginning of the dry season, the female iguanas leave the branches to lay their eggs in the river banks among the roots of the fig tree. This is when they are most vulnerable to attack and are most alert, watching and listening for the slightest signs of danger. The sand and gravel in which they will lay their eggs must be exactly the right temperature and humidity, and they may dig several holes before deciding on the one which suits them. The eggs are leathery and white, like those of other reptiles. She will lay a clutch of up to 30 eggs. When she has finished, she fills in the hole as best she can and leaves the eggs to incubate in the warm sand. She will have no more to do with them and returns to the branches of the fig tree. The safety of the eggs is left to chance. If coates move in, nothing is safe. When a family explores the forest floor, poking their long noses into every nook and cranny and digging with their powerful claws, very little escapes. They will eat anything, including iguana eggs, that haven't been sufficiently well hidden.
It's easy to see how the Koati was given its scientific name, Nasua. It means nosy one. After gorging on iguana eggs, they heap themselves together for a siesta in the heat of the afternoon. While the adult howlers sleep, the youngsters stay awake, and like children, they seize their chance to explore. About three months after they were laid, those iguana eggs that have survived will be ready to hatch. The young iguana must tear a hole in its leathery shell with specially adapted razor-edged claws, unlike birds which possess an egg tooth to help them break out. As soon as they are strong enough, they dig their way out of the sand and make for cover. Almost immediately they begin to look for food, sampling all the leaves within reach. At this age too they have their enemies. The green-headed tree snake is extremely aggressive and takes a heavy toll of young iguanas.
Towards the end of the afternoon, as the heat of the day subsides, shadows begin to lengthen. Blossoming trees along the river's edge attract hummingbirds to feed. The hour before sunset is a time when those animals which are most active in daylight prepare for the night and others awaken. The Coates look around for a suitable tree in which to build a nest of leaves and twigs for the night. This must be high enough above the forest floor to be safe from predators. Howlers leave the fig tree by way of a hanging vine. The big male is the last to leave. Sack-winged bats roost during the day on the trunk of a fig tree overhanging the water. They are given the name sack-winged because the males have glands on their wings which produce a scent which attracts females. An agouti creeps from under a branch fallen from the fig tree. It can run at great speed through the forest, its feet being unusual for a rodent in having claws shaped like hooves. It is preyed upon by all the larger carnivores, which perhaps explains its perpetual state of nervousness. The jaguarundi is one of the forest cats which preys on agoutis. It is about twice the size of a domestic cat and hunts during the day as well as by night. Alerted by the warning call of the jay, that is one agouti to cheat the jaguarundis of a meal. In the darkness, the truly nocturnal animals emerge. A boa constrictor hunts for mice and small rodents amongst the roots of the fig tree. A female scorpion carries her offspring on her back when she searches for prey among the leaves. 
one hurries to catch up with her. When all is still and quiet, first one pucker emerges from its burrow under a fig tree, and then another. Packers are closely related to the agoutis, but grow much larger, an adult weighing up to 23 pounds and measuring nearly three feet in length. They are fond of figs, but also browse on leaves. Above the ground, the remaining pucker is careful to conceal the entrance with leaves and twigs. Puckers have a hollow bone in their skull, unique among mammals, which gives a strange resonance to their peculiar cries. Another dawn, a new day. The call of the howler echoes through the valley as it has for thousands of years. Generations of fig trees have given life and shelter to countless generations of animals and plants. Let us be sure that the forest is still there for those generations yet to come.